In the previous episode, we discussed the development of America's current main battle tank, the M1 Abrams. Though many tout that tank as the best in the world, its European counterparts often offer stiff competition. One particular rival has been vying to knock the American contender out of the scene even before the US accepted the Abrams for service. That tank is the German-manufactured Leopard 2. In this video, we will cross the Atlantic in order to learn the story behind this feline and discover why, to many, it is considered to be the best modern tank in the world. Over a century ago, the first tanks entered combat in the Battle of the Somme. Since then, hundreds of designs have seen use in every conflict, from small local battles to the largest wars. Some of these are destined for failure, cursed by their own design. Those that succeed went on to shape warfare in ways no one could have imagined. Prepare to dive into the complex stories of tank development as we peel back the pages of history on some of the world's most iconic designs. Through ingenuity, sweat and blood, these machines have been forged for battle. This episode of Forged for Battle has been brought to you by the online tank action game, Armored Warfare. Armored Warfare is a free-to-play game that allows you to take control of hundreds of unique vehicles from the early Cold War to the most modern main battle tanks and beyond. Sign up today by using the link in the description and on top of all the free tanks you can unlock, you'll get a free Type 59 2A Premium MBT and 7 days of premium time. Once you log in and claim your rewards, send my battalion, the Cult of Cone, an application and you can join me on the battlefield. Huge thanks to them for sponsoring this series and giving me access to the various Leopard variants I'll be using throughout the video. Now let's get into today's topic. It's easy to assume that the Leopard 2 was just a further development from the original Leopard tank. This, however, is not entirely the case, and in fact, the Leopard 2 shares many of its early development with the Abrams. Much like that tank, the program that would lead to the Leopard 2 began with the joint program between the Americans and Germans which produced the KPZ-70. This program quickly proved to be far too costly for the West German government and they withdrew in 1969. However, the development cost would not be entirely lost as many of the technologies from the KPZ would see their way into future tank designs. This had begun even prior to the withdrawal with Porsche being awarded a contract in 1965 to develop improved technology for the Leopard which had just been accepted for service. Although the terms of the joint program did not allow for a parallel national tank development program, that would not prevent the Germans from attempting to keep their MBT, which was already in service, as close to the standards set by the KPZ-70 as possible. This would eventually lead to the so-called Vergoldete Leopard, or Gilded Leopard. As the KPZ program began to fall apart, the Gilded Leopard project continued to receive interest, eventually becoming known as the Kaila, or Wild Boar, in 1967. This would lead to the production of two prototypes in 1969 and 1970. The main contractor assigned to the project was Krauss Maffei, with Porsche working on the chassis and Wegman developing the turret. Alongside this development, another study was begun in 1969 to try and salvage as much of the KPZ program as possible. This would become known as the EBA or BOR, but would never leave the drawing board. In early 1970, it was decided by the German Defense Minister Helmut Schmidt to continue the Gilded Leopard program. Opting now to use the MTU engine which had already been developed for the KPZ program, a total of 17 prototypes were now to be produced, with Krauss Maffei still the main contractor. Of these 17 prototypes, 16 would be completed along with 17 turrets between 1972 and 1974. Overall, these tanks would largely resemble the Leopard 1A4 visually, with a more wedge-shaped front and would receive the pre-series designation Leopard 2K. There was also some thought put into a Leopard 2FK, which would have carried over much of the firepower from the KPZ, allowing the use of the 152mm Shillelagh missile, although this was discarded in 1971 with the 2K being focused on. Throughout the multitude of prototypes, many different technologies were compared with some of these including armament, propulsion, and suspension among others. Ten of the turrets were armed with a 105mm smoothbore gun and the other seven armed with the 120mm smoothbore. One of the prototypes, designated PT-11, would also receive a remote-controlled 20mm mounted on the turret roof. Most of the prototype hulls received the previously mentioned MTU MB873 KA500 12-cylinder multi-fuel engine. 
four of them would be tested with a slightly modified engine. Two suspension types were tested, with some of the prototypes receiving the hydropneumatic system from the KPZ, but ultimately the alternative torsion bar system was chosen. Testing of the prototypes would take place from 1972 into 1974, taking place mainly in Germany, although some of the extreme weather testing would take place in Canada and Arizona. Interest in the project by the Americans led to them purchasing one of the prototypes for themselves, which would influence their ongoing tank program. The main issue that was identified from these trials was the requirement of the program limiting the tank to a total weight of 50 tons. Without the ability to exceed this, increasing the armor of the tank was proving difficult and was a clear flaw in the design. This eventually led to the development of a new lighter turret called the Spitzmaus Term or Shrew Turret in the hopes of bringing the weight down. In 1973, the analysis of the Yom Kippur War would make it clear that increased armor was of vital importance for future conflicts. Following this, the decision was made to move the weight limit up to 60 tons, allowing increased protection as well as resulting in a new multi-layer armored turret. This is not to say the development of the Leopard 2 existed in a vacuum, as there were a number of parallel proposals made during this period, including improvements to the original Leopard. However, that is best left for a separate video, since in the end the Leopard 2's weight problem was solved with the increase to 60 tons. As development continued, so did interest from the Americans. Although slightly behind the Germans in their progress, the Americans themselves were in the middle of their own program for a future main battle tank to replace their aging M60s. Although already working with two domestic companies to produce prototypes of their own, it was decided to accept the Leopard 2 into their selection trials for potential adoption. These altered demands from the German and US militaries culminated in the Leopard 2 AV or Auster version. This new design added spaced armor to the hull and a brand new turret. Two prototype hulls of this style were constructed with the designations PT-19 and 20, as well as three turrets designated T-19, 20, and 21. These were completed by 1976. PT-19 was intended to compete in trials against the L7A3 105mm armed XM1s, so it was modified to use the same gun, although the 120mm could easily be swapped in. T-19 was also equipped with a simpler fire control system than T-20 and 21. Unfortunately, due to the modification program taking longer than expected, the Leopard would never go up against the two XM1s directly, and the Americans would choose the Chrysler design without waiting for the German tank. However, at the end of August in 1976, PT-19 with the T-19 turret, as well as PT-20 with extra weight to simulate a turret, were flown to the US by a C-5A Galaxy. An additional hull and turret were also sent for firing trials. Comparative tests using the prototypes were conducted at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, mirroring the earlier tests of the XM1s until December 1976. Although the Leopard proved itself comparable or superior in many aspects to the XM1, it was inferior in armor and had a higher price tag, which led to it losing to the Chrysler design. Ironically, given the fact that the earlier Leopard 2 prototype had provided a source for some of the technology used in the XM1 program, the German companies unintentionally gave the competition the tools they needed to beat them. Following the tests, PT-19 and 20 were returned to Germany, although the turret was left in the US where it was later adapted onto the earlier prototype chassis they already had. It was then modified to use the Rhein Mattel 120mm like the German prototypes, as the US was discussing the possibility of using the gun on future versions of the XM1. After more firing trials, this turret would be returned to Germany as well, where it was upgraded to the same standard as the other turrets for the German evaluations. Pre series production of the Leopard 2 would begin on the 20th of January 1977, with three chassis and two turrets being ordered. The first chassis was fitted with the already completed turret T-21 and was used in troop trials until early 1979 at the German Armor School in Münster. The other two vehicles were used in acceptance trials as well as the final tests in 1979. In September of 1977, the Leopard 2 was finally accepted for production with 1800 being planned for delivery in five batches. Production of the tanks was split between the primary contractor Kraus Maffei who would produce 55% and Machine and Fabrique Kiel who would be subcontracted for the remaining 45%. In total, it is estimated that 25,000 components of the Leopard 2 were subcontracted between various companies. On the 25th of October 1979, the fourth tank off the production line would officially become the first production Leopard 2. 
Visually, these new Leopard 2s were not much different from their older brothers aside from the bigger gun and new turret. The real changes were internal, with a new incredibly powerful engine and automatic transmission. The design of this engine into a solid power pack allowed the entire unit to be swapped out in as little as 15 minutes depending on the conditions and crew skills. In the turret it received improved armor protection and the EMES-15 sight. The tanks were planned to be equipped with thermal imaging but this was not ready for the initial production although each vehicle could easily be upgraded with it later. Ammunition in the turret was now stored in a special compartment in the rear which was designed with a blowout panel to protect the crew in the event of a hit from the side or rear. The first batch of Leopard 2s would amount to 380 vehicles with 6 in 1979, 100 in 1980, and 220 in 1981. By 1982 production was running at about 300 per year with the end of the first batch delivered in March. These tanks would replace the M48A2Gs which were currently in service with many units as well as allowing the Leopard 1s already in service to be given to the Panzer Battalions of the Panzer Grenadier Divisions. The second batch would begin immediately following the end of the first although a number of improvements would be added. These included the thermal imaging systems and a variety of minor changes to improve maintenance and refueling time. This earned the second batch the designation of Leopard 2A1. 450 would be delivered with the last rolling off the production line in November of 1983. Batch 3 would be one year's worth of production totaling to 300 Leopard 2s from November of 83 to November of 84. These tanks received a new deflector for the commander's primary sight as well as a larger cover for the NBC protection system. These would be added to the second batch as well so batch 3 was also made up of Leopard 2A1s. As Batch 3 was being completed, a program to modernize the first batch of Leopard 2s would begin. Somewhat confusingly, although they were brought to the same standard as the second and third batch, they would receive the designation of Leopard 2A2. This program was completed in 1987, taking place alongside Batches 3 through 5. For the sake of time, from this point on I'll be just discussing the changes made rather than the specifics of each batch. In December of 1984, the Leopard 2A3 would see production. This variant would see the introduction of new digital radio sets as well as having the ammunition reloading hatches welded shut. Although this may seem like a terrible change, it was actually done due to testing that revealed that a hit to the turret could result in a leak which would cause a loss of the tank's overpressure. Essentially, this would void the crew's NBC protection making the tank vulnerable to environmental hazards. The gunner also received a new adjustable chest support which they could use while the tank was on the move. The next variant, designated Leopard 2A4, would see production from 1985 all the way until 1992. In total, four of the production batches would receive this designation for a total of 695 built. This variant also saw some of the most major changes to the tank, such as repositioning of the return rollers as well as new tracks. The ammunition hatch on the turret side was fully removed instead of being welded shut. The fire control computer now would use a digital core which allowed the use of new ammunition. To improve crew survivability, a fire and explosion suppression system was installed. A modernization program was again done to all previous variants of the Leopard 2, bringing them up to the standard of the 2A4. This brought the total Leopard 2A4s in German service to 2,125. One minor thing to note here is that although all the Leopard 2s would receive the 2A4 designation, the tanks from the first four batches never received the fire and explosion suppression system, only being equipped with the automatic fire extinguishing system. By this point in the Leopard 2's production, it was no longer confined specifically to German use and had been purchased by a number of other nations. An additional 445 tanks were produced for the Netherlands, as well as being produced under license in Switzerland as the Panzer 87 Leopard. Following the end of the Cold War, further stock of the already produced Leopards would be sold to a variety of countries such as Turkey, Greece, Sweden, Chile, Finland, Poland, Austria, Spain, Canada, Singapore, Norway, Denmark, and Portugal. This made it the most common and well-known version of the tank. With that being the case, it's also the version of the tank that would see the most service. So what causes so many to claim the Leopard 2 as the best tank in the entire world? Unlike the Abrams, its combat history is more limited as we will discuss in part 2 of this video. That leaves us with the design and technology of the tank earning it this title. Looking at the equipment the Leopard 2 has been equipped with, it's certainly a convincing case. 
The fire control system had virtually no equal in the early days of its production, and constant improvements kept it from falling behind other designs. As many will point out, it does fall behind in the protection aspect, with the Abrams overall being considered better armored. Realistically, no one vehicle can be best at all aspects of war, but at least with the variants we discussed, it's my opinion that the Leopard 2 was a very strong contender if we look purely at tank-on-tank -tank combat. I base this off the fact that delivering the first hit in an engagement almost always results in winning that engagement, and with the Leopard 2's superior target acquisition and fire control systems, this would mean it had an edge over both friend and foe. I think this is a good place to end this video though, so I open the floor for you to discuss whether I'm right or wrong about that in the comments below. In the next part of this video, we'll take a look at the more recent modifications of the Leopard 2, starting from the 2A5, as well as the combat usage of the tank. Until then, if you liked the video, please be sure to show it by clicking the like and subscribing. If you disliked it, please let me know why in the comments so I can work to improve my future content. As always, links to my sources can be found in the description if you want to learn more. I'll see you in the next episode of this series where we'll be looking at the Soviet T-64.